Hey, what's up guys? Back again with another video in the Java IO series. This episode, I'm going to be teaching you about buffer streams. So first of all, obviously, what are buffered streams? And buffer streams are a subclass of the filter stream classes. So, you know, what we learned last episode. So they are filter streams themselves. So that's the most essential thing. Don't forget that, you know, the hierarchy. So, of course, we learned last episode that a filter input stream is a subclass of input stream. And then under that, if we go to filter input stream, the class, we can see that we have different subclasses for that class, right? And um, one of those subclasses is a um, buffer input stream, right? Buffered input stream. So we can click that and we can see that it has everything that we might expect as the um, the read method, it has all a bunch of stuff, it has everything that the the filter input stream has, except that it has a few um, custom variables here: buff, count, mark limit, mark position, and position, which are custom variables that you can use um, whenever you're working with a subclass of buffer stream in case you want to declare um, your custom, maybe a buffer stream for yourself, maybe or something like that. Um, but um, yeah, we don't have to really worry about these, but these will allow you to access the buffer, which we'll learn about later. But just know that they're there in case we ever use those. But um, yeah, we have the simple constructors here, which we're going to go over in a second. And then, of course, we have all the same methods because every subclass of filter input stream and input stream have all these methods so that they can access and manipulate the underlying stream. OK, so how do buffered streams work? That's, you know, another essential question, obviously. So if we, let me just pull this up right here. We got this little diagram I made for you. And so right here we have what's called a buffered input stream. So it's accepting input. So it's a type of filter input stream, a buffered input stream that is going to be placed upon a, um, a underlying stream. For example, in this case, in this example, a file input stream, which is going to be accessing a disk drive or something like that, right? So anyway, we have our, um, a simple, let's say we have a simple stream right here, a file input stream, which we've gone over two episodes ago. And then we want to create a buffer input stream on top of that, you know, to help filter in some way. So what's going to happen is, is whenever a stream, a buffer stream is created, a internal byte array is going to be created also, and that's going to be called the buffer. And the buffer is going to be a byte array that holds bytes of data that you that you obtain from the input stream. So once that's created, that buffer is going to be filled to the max with all of the data um, that it can fit from the from the stream here. Okay, from the file input stream, it's going to be filled to the max with that data. So it's just going to fit as many bytes as it can fit from the underlying stream. And whenever we call upon the read method, it's not going to read data directly from you know the filter stream or the file input stream, the underlying stream. It's going to read data from the buffer. And we can talk about the purpose of the buffer later on, but just know that instead of reading it directly from the stream, it's going to be read from the buffer itself, okay? Which is going to be a temporary byte array stored into the memory of your computer, okay? So as it's reading, of course, the buffer byte array is going to be emptied at some point because eventually you're going to be sending bytes from here to your program. And then eventually it's going to get less and less filled with bytes because you're transferring them to the program. So eventually it's going to get empty, right? And when it gets empty, the next read method that is called upon a emptied buffer array is going to refill the buffer array with the data found from the file input stream or the, you know, the filter stream, right? So it's just going to refill it from the stream and, so, and put it into the memory, you know, the buffer byte array, okay? And this process is just going to repeat until the stream itself, the file input stream, the underlying stream is going to be empty, right? So it's just going to go until it stops, you know, delivering data or runs out of data or until you stop the program or something like that. But as long as you know how the buffer works, then you can pretty much understand buffer streams because it's really simple. So just again to recap, the buffer byte array, which is called the buffer, is going to be created as soon as the buffer input stream is going to be created. And then as you call upon the read method, which is going to, you know, try and get data from the underlying stream, it's not going to get data from the uh, underlying stream directly, it's going to get data from the byte array that we have here that was just filled up. And then it's going to allow you to deliver that data to somewhere in your program. And then eventually as the buffer gets emptied, it's going to refill it next time you call the read method with new data. And it's just going to repeat that process, okay? So yeah, hopefully that whole process makes sense for you. And a buffer output stream is very similar to the buffer input stream as you can imagine. So as you write bytes of data into it, the data is not directly inputted into the underlying stream, but into a byte array buffer. Okay, so now that we've gone over the buffered input stream, let me show you how the buffered output stream works. So a buffered output stream works very similarly. Right here we have a program that's just going to be outputting data at some point, as all programs do. And as you write bytes of data into it, into the output stream, um, the data isn't directly put into the underlying stream or through the filter into the underlying stream. It's going to be placed into a temporary buffer byte array until it's filled up or until it's flushed, okay? So basically the data inside the buffer as it's put into here um, won't be outputted into the you know underlying stream until the buffer is filled up or until it's manually flushed. So this is the same exact concept you might realize behind the system.out 
uh, stream, which is a print stream, and a buffered stream. A print stream is a type of bu buffered stream. So I just want to make a quick correction real quick. I said that a print stream is a subclass, or, or it is a buffered output stream, but it's not, because if you look here on the buffered output stream, and we go back up to filter output stream, we can go here and we see that one of the subclasses of filter output stream is print stream. So print stream isn't a subclass of uh, buffered output stream, but it's a subclass of uh, filter output stream, okay? And so the difference is really is that a print stream does have a sort of buffer. It does some, it does buffer in some kind of way because you do have to flush it as time, at times because whenever you call the right method, you have to flush it. Um, but it's not a subclass of buffered output stream, so it's not exactly the same, okay? Just be aware of that so you're not confused. I don't want to mislead you. But either way, don't worry. Um, next episode, we're going to be going over the print stream in detail. We're going to be going over the whole class and how it works and stuff like that. So yeah, stay tuned for that. So hopefully you remember that in our past programs, you know, showing you how to use like file streams and stuff like that. We would use system.out and .write to test our output. And then we would have to call system.out.flush. Because system.out is a print stream, which is a buffered stream, so it has a buffer. So you have to manually flush it unless the buffer gets filled up at some point, okay? So again, just to recap, to you know reinforce what I just told you, a program is going to output data into a buffer, a byte array buffer, and then eventually when that buffer is filled, it's going to automatically output all of that data into the underlying stream at once. But if it's not automatically filled up at some point, you can manually flush the byte array into the underlying stream by calling upon the flush method, which is available to any buffered stream. So yeah, that's how we that's why we use that. So hopefully now you have a good understanding of how the you know the buffer array works internally. So now we can go ahead and show you how to make a buffered stream. So let's go to our Javadoc skin and let's take a look at these constructors here, okay? So for your example, buffered input stream, we have two constructors here, okay? We have the first one, which is accepting an input stream. And this is very similar to a regular filter stream. It's just going to serve as the underlying stream that we're connecting to this buffered input stream. But also down here, we have a second parameter, an optional parameter, because this one's, you know, the default one, pretty much. So this is going to be int size. And the size, as you might imagine, is going to be the size of the buffer. So we can actually customize the size of our buffer, which is pretty interesting. And if you don't, you know, provide a size within the constructor, then by default, if you use this one, the size is going to automatically be, I think, at least 8 megabytes. Because I think it used to be, you know, 2 megabytes. But as, you know, storage uh, capabilities have increased over time, I think Java increased it to 8 megabytes at least from what I've looked up, but I might be wrong, but it should be 8 megabytes, that's what I've seen from now, okay? So since you can choose the size of a buffer, you may be wondering how, you know, what size should you choose for your buffers? Like, why not just put like a million or something like that, or just any number? So that you should choose a specific amount, it's actually important to choose the right amount, and choosing the size for the buffer will depend upon the type of input or the type of output you have in its hardware specifications. So for example, the file stream buffers, um, usually depend upon the block size of the disk. So like this, you know, the uh, specifications of the disk, how, you know, fast it is and stuff like that. It just depends on your hardware capabilities, basically on what you should choose for your size. And if you're interested in how to choose um, a good size for your buffer stream, then go ahead and look up some extra resources on that because it's a little complicated. So just do in some independent research on how to do that. Okay, so now that I've rambled on a little bit about how it works and the mechanics behind the buffered input stream and the output stream, then let's go ahead and start coding an example of using the buffered input stream and the buffered output stream so that we can get some real world experience with it. So what we're going to do is basically make a program that can take um, input from a file, from a file input stream, and then deliver it to a file output stream to another file basically. So file transfer, we've done this before, two episodes ago. So we're going to do that, but this time the difference is that we're going to be applying a buffer on top of the file input stream. So we're going to be adding a filter of a buffer to go along with it. Okay, so let's declare that. Um, right now, so we're going to do buffered input stream, and let's call this input is equal to null, and then we'll do we'll do buffered output stream output is equal to null, and then we're going to do try, and we're going to do input. We're just going to declare now, so new input or new buffered input stream. And now inside of here, it's asking for an input stream, an instance of input stream. And since, like I said, we want to get, you know, input from a file, all we got to do is, I mean, we could just declare a new file input stream um, outside of here and, you know, instantiate it if you want to. Or you can just do it inside of here, really, if you want to. So a new file input stream, because we don't really need to get an, like a variable reference of this or an object reference of the file input stream. We only need to have an object reference of this 
so that we can access the file in Twitch stream. So we can just do it inside of here, no issue. And so inside of here is asking for a file to reference. So let's open this up so we can check it out. Now I have two files here. I have data.txt and the new data.txt, which will be the place that data is delivered to. So just to you know access the data, we'll have we'll have data.txt. Okay. And that should do that for us. So we're gonna establish so that should do that for us. We're just we just made a new buffered input stream that is connected to a file input stream. So yeah, pretty simple. And now let's do the same thing for output. Okay, so output is equal to uh, buffered output stream and new file output stream. And we'll call this new data.txt because that's our file, right? Okay, pretty simple. And now let's add the catch exception thingy here. Catch s out ex. And inside of here we need to um, let's think about how we want to do this, right? So all we need to do is get all of the data, all of the bytes from the first file and then move it to the second file, which is pretty simple. We just need a for loop here for int i is equal to zero. And then i, or no, not equal to zero, is equal to input.read because we're reading one byte of input from the buffer, right? Or, you know, the stream, I guess, if you want to be non-technical about it. And then now we can do i is not equal to input uh, or negative one rather, because negative one means end of stream. So as long as it's not the end of stream, we just want to continue, right? And then we can do input.read again, okay? We've already gone over this again. But um, so now that we have the input, now that we can iterate through the input, let's output the input step by step with the output dot write method. So then we just provide the output or the input into the output like that. And then, uh, yeah, that's all we gotta do. And then of course, we want to also add output.flush because um, if, if it works correctly, it should flush automatically if it ever fills up, but maybe towards the end it doesn't fill up all the way, so we just want to flush it at the very end just in case it doesn't fill up at some point, okay? Just to make sure everything is outputted before the program ends. That's very important. And so yeah, that's all we got to do for that, but of course let's also um, close everything, close the streams once we're done using them, just to free up resources and stuff like that. So we'll do finally um, try if um, input is not equal to null we'll say, or we'll just do input.close, so we're closing both, so when we call this, of course, it's closing both the the buffered input stream and the underlying stream of file input stream, okay? Don't forget that. And then we'll just copy this right here. We'll do the same thing for output. Okay, output. And we now we just need to handle those exceptions again inside of here. There we go. All right, so that's it for that. So let's run it and see what happens. Oh yeah, I need to show you the data inside of here. So this is just the dummy data I added to the file just by default, simple lorem ipsum like we did before. And so now if we look inside this file here with the new data.txt file, we can see all of the data has been transferred successfully. It's the exact same thing and it works the exact same way, except that behind the scenes, a buffer is being utilized so that the data is put into a buffer and then um, it's not using as many resources. So, so that takes us to our next point, why use a buffered stream? And it's all about performance. Whenever you um, well, whenever you know you're going to be using or transferring large amounts of data in streams, a buffered stream ensures that you aren't constantly accessing system resources every time you need to read a byte of data. Imagine having to call the, the read method over and over and over and over, or the write method over and over and over and over. That's going to use up a lot of resources, right? So think about it this way, okay? So um, you need to access like 16,000 bytes of data. That's, kind of, that's just a random number I chose, but you have to access 16,000 thousand bytes of data from a file over time, okay? A random amount of time. And every time you need to read a single byte of data from that file, you need to call the read method, obviously, which makes the operating system access the file. And this takes up a good amount of system resources. So therefore, with a buffer, once you implement a buffer onto your stream, you can initially read as many bytes as possible into the byte array, and then use the read method to access the data in the buffer instead of directly from the file. Then whenever the buffer is emptied, the buffer can just re be refilled all at once without having to constantly call the read method over a long period of time. It's only called whenever it's needed, okay? Or it's only accessing the output stream whenever it's needed or the input stream whenever it's needed. Therefore, when you call the read method normally, it's going to be only accessing the system memory um, because that's where the byte array is rather than having to access the disk every time, okay? So it's just um, all about managing resources and stuff like that. It's just better to use it whenever you know you have to access a lot of data, okay? So if you did not understand my explanation, if you would like a detailed explanation, I'll drop a link in the description for some good info on it. There's a really good uh, Stack Overflow um, thing for it, so I'll leave that for you, okay? So yeah, that's about it. Um, we didn't do much coding, but a lot of explaining, so hopefully I explained it well. 
Um, I did a lot of pre preparing for this, so hopefully you thought it was good. So if it wasn't good, just let me know how I can improve. And if it was good, just let me know what about it you thought was good. And yeah, so hopefully now you have a good understanding of how to use buffered streams on top of your streams and to make your programs more efficient for your system. Um, I'll leave all of today's code in the description below as I always do along with some good resources if, if you need some help understanding buffered streams. So yeah, and um, that's about it for this episode. As I said, um, if you have any questions about what I showed you today, you can ask in the comment section below. I'll be glad to help you or you can join our Discord server. I'd rather you do that because we have a team of, of a bunch of developers who will be glad to help you out. And um, yeah, you can ask questions there, leave suggestions for future videos, anything like that, leave feedback. I'll be glad if you join. So just join that. The link is in the description for you. And then, of course, if you want to support this channel, if you want to donate to the channel to help improve the quality of the videos, then you can click the join button below this video and you can join this channel as a member for $1, $5, or $10 a month. And you can cancel anytime if you want to. So, yeah, thank you for your support. If you like this video, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe and peace.